let me talk to you about what is happening politically with respect to uh, the whole energy question. You cannot raise the issue of energy around the world without bumping into the whole challenge of the political issue of climate change, or as it used to be known, global warming. We could be using a little global warming this winter, but uh, it's now be called climate change because if you have a nasty storm, why, that's because of all of the CO2 or other greenhouse gases we put into the atmosphere. It used to be the only consequence of putting greenhouse gases in the atmosphere was that we were causing the planet to heat up, but when the planet stopped heating up for the last decade, now it is climate change. This is affecting everything that's being done with respect to energy around the world because it has demonized fossil fuels. The market forces say you should continue to burn coal, you should continue to burn gasoline or oil, and the climate change debate says you should never ever again burn coal and you should never again burn oil we will allow you to burn a little natural gas, but we want that phased out as fast as possible. And we should get to the promised land when there are no greenhouse emissions at all. And that overall political circumstance is affecting energy policy, not only in our country, but in other countries as well. It is particularly strong in Europe, and they, there is a, a very strong political view in, in Europe, that the primary problem with global warming is the United States and our refusal to first embrace the Kyoto Protocol and uh, then our subsequent foot dragging on the kinds of things that Europe feels very strongly about. I was talking to a German parliamentarian who said to me, we look at the kinds of cars you Americans drive, and we know that you are the ones who are causing all of the global warming. I didn't point out to him that uh, one of the popular American cars is Mercedes-Benz, that is part of his economy back home in Germany, and he probably wouldn't like it if we banned all Mercedes-Benz and said that everybody has to buy a tiny, compact car. This is the perfect political issue because you are doing something that no one can argue with. You are saving the planet. And who in the world can, can criticize you as a politician for calling for sacrifice in order to save the planet? This is even better than motherhood and apple pie. This is survival. And we won't know whether the science is really correct or not for 40 years, at which time your political career will be over. So if you're wrong, you won't have to pay any kind of political price. That is the perfect political issue for people to embrace. And the Europeans have embraced it. Gives them another chance to get mad at the Americans. Gives them something in their lives that they can devote themselves to that is a cause greater than themselves. And they may feel virtuous about how stingy they are with respect to energy. Now, when you get to the realities of the situation, you find it fairly different. Most European countries who did sign the, the Kyoto Protocol have not been able to live up to the pledges they made in Kyoto. And some who did have not really changed their pattern of greenhouse gas emissions because they were already on a glide path to meet the Kyoto standards so they could get there without doing anything that caused any real time of sacrifice in their economy or in their lives. But to get serious about it, they have to make projections as to where they will be in 2020 or 2050 or wherever it is. Went to the place where they trade carbon credits. I, it's like a Bloomberg room with the the screen on the wall and the squiggly lines and the kind of thing, and you look like you're trading a stock, only you know, up so much, down so much. 
I, I figured it out. You could buy a ton of carbon emissions for 20 pounds, which would be about $35 in American money. And then I looked a little more, got into it. They, they said, we very much want the Americans to do this because this really is meaningless without the Americans. We're just trading carbon emissions for the UK. We've got to get the Americans in the regime. I looked at it and I said, there's no transportation part of this. The only thing you're trading is carbon emissions out of utilities, electric utilities. And in America, there's great concern about the greenhouse gas emissions coming from automobiles and trucks and barges and other forms of transportation. There's no transportation component. He said, no, that, that's right. We're only doing utilities. And I said, why are you only doing cap and trade trading on emissions from utilities? He said, that's the only place where we have any accurate data. We don't have any idea what the emissions really are in any other sector of the economy. And how can you have a trading regime when you do not have accurate data about the commodity you're trading? <laughs> I thought, okay. I don't think that's going to stop global warming. If you put your cap and trade on that kind of a, a limited basis, but then I said to him, do the ratepayers of the United Kingdom know that they are paying for that 20 pounds? <coughs> he said, they're beginning to find it out. And I thought, okay, there is a political issue in the making. Once the ratepayers finding out that their rate bills are going up in order to support this system, they're going to, uh, they're going to react strongly in a political way. And uh, I pointed out to him that support for any kind of uh, carbon reduction regime in the United States disappeared when gasoline was $4 a gallon at the pump. He said there was a political backlash that was huge, and then support for some kind of cap and trade began to come back when the price of the pump went back down. I said, maybe you didn't feel that in, in uh, Great Britain, because you don't drive nearly as much as we do. And he smiled a little wryly and he said, Gordon Brown's approval rating has been at its absolute lowest point when oil was at $145 a barrel. No, the average Briton doesn't drive that much, but we all felt it. And yes, what happens in the marketplace, the prices does have a political impact. So, moving now to where we are in the U.S. Congress. There's proposals to in, in establish a cap-and-trade program in the United States, a bill to do that, pass the House of Representatives, and we've had hearings in the Senate to deal with it. The House bill is dead. People in the Senate have looked at it, they've looked at its complexity, they've looked at what it would do to energy prices, and there is no appetite at all on the part of the Senate, with one or two notable exceptions, who I shall not name. No, no appetite in the Senate to do the House bill at all. But as we hold our hearings to say, well, we have to do something it's interesting to see how the issue has migrated. Cap and trade is the way to go. Now people are saying it really should just be cap and tax. We should just put a tax on carbon. Why? Because it's a whole lot simpler than setting up this trading mechanism and having people bidding and selling and auctioning. Just put a tax on carbon, and that will, will uh, have the impact of having people reduce their carbon out. It's simpler. Businessmen I have talked to said, if you're going to do this, we don't think you should, but if you're going to do this,
just tax it because then we know what we're dealing with. The uncertainties of the cap and trade regimen drive us crazy. We don't like the tax, but if you just tax it, we at least have a degree of certainty. All right. Now, the conversation has gone from cap and tax to cap and dividend. Because the question comes, if you're going to put a tax on carbon, what are you going to do with the money that you get as a result of raising that tax? And back to my question in the United Kingdom, do the ratepayers understand that they are paying for this? Well, we will, this is the new cap and dividend idea. We will put a tax on carbon, either in the form of a direct tax or a cap and trade regime. And then the money that comes into the federal government, we will rebate to the ratepayers and to the people who buy gasoline, I suppose, for their automobiles and so on, to mitigate the economic impact on them. And I was sufficiently uh, politically incorrect to say, well, if we're taking it from the American people for the purpose of giving it back to the American people, why don't we just leave it with the American people in the first place? <laughs> so that's where it is. The debate is going on, uh, the conversation in the Senate is on tax and dividend, uh, on cap and dividend, and uh, we do not have, at the moment, a clear path. When Pete Domenici stepped down as the ranking Republican on the Energy and uh, Water Subcommittee of the Appropriations Committee, and I was next in line, I realized if I was going to carry out that responsibility, I had to inform myself far more thoroughly than I had been informed. And so one of the first things I did was to go to all the national labs, because that subcommittee funds the national labs at Los Alamos, Livermore, uh, Sandia, Oak Ridge, so on. And I've been to all of them, including the Idaho nuclear lab. I had not realized until I got to the national labs that the scientists there are those who have run the models on climate change. The models that the, the International Panel on Climate Change depend on for their projections were run on the computers at the American National Labs, and many of those scientists were doing that. All right, without giving you any detail, bottom line, I sat down with those scientists and said, all right, tell me about greenhouse gases and global warming and climate change. Is it real? You're a scientist, there's no paper here. I, I just want, as a policymaker, to understand exactly where we are. And different opinions from different scientists. But on this basic point, this basic summary, there is absolute consensus. We don't know. <laughs> And one put it this way, he said, the climate system is so horrendously complex that we do not understand how it works. And he said, in the studies we have run that have come up with the models we have created, come up with the projections that the IPCC has, has put forward, we have really only studied two things. One is temperature, and the other is the acidity of oceans. And we have drawn some conclusions from what we have found by studying temperature and the acidity of oceans that say to us, human activity, particularly in the form of greenhouse gases, is having an impact on climate and is producing a change in the climate. How much of the fat of the changes that are occurring in the climate are due to that human impact, we don't know. Because there are so many other things that affect the climate 
that we have not studied. And it is entirely possible that those other things are producing all of the temperature change and all of the acidity that's occurring in the oceans and the human activity has no impact whatsoever. We, the scientists, don't think that human activity has no impact. But when you ask us in this context how much of an impact, we don't know. And I said, how long would it take you to find out? And they had an appropriator in the room, and uh, you know how that works. They said, well, if you would fund the studies here at the National Labs, thereby preserving our jobs, it would take us about 10 years to find out. Now, interestingly, what has happened in the last 10 years says to me, we've got the 10 years to do that.